Hello and welcome to Castable. This is the podcast which brings brilliant guests to pitch their dream music festival. I'm the host, Matt Hoss, and I'm here to be the analytical hype man, which will be looking over the finer details of the festival while singing its praises. We're going to be talking about the festival, the music, and why we love the things that we do. Today's guest is a podcast and stand-up leviathan. He has appeared on the Conan O'Brien show, and you will know him as the legendary host of the pioneering podcast, The Comedian's Comedian Podcast. It's Mr. Stuart Goldsmith. Hello. What an introduction. My well, God. That was such a big introduction, Matt, that I have um, momentarily <laughs> forgotten. What did you say in the end? You said you're going to be the analytical hype man. Yeah. Did you like that bit? Analytical hype man. I didn't dislike it, but I found it quite <laughs> confusing. Sure, that's right. This is uh, the last episode of the season, and I've had okay. to change that kind of. I tried to change it every single time, and uh, to be honest, uh, I wrote that five minutes before the recording. The analytical so. hype man. Let's just let's just think about that. No, one. don't don't right. think about it. Move on right. fast, hype Stuart. Man. Move, move on fast. <laughs> That uh, moving on fast to, so as not to analyse something. So yeah, that's exactly yeah. what an analytical hype man would do. Let's do it. It's okay. Um, it's it's my podcast. Stuart. We'll do it. Do it my way. Stop stop analysing my things. Uh, <laughs> who analyses that analytical hype man? It's Stuart Goldsmith. Uh, how yeah. are you doing today? I'm really good, mate. Thank you. Um, I, it was just my birthday uh, last yes. weekend. Yes, uh, I went camping and I saw a comet. So I'm very excited. Oh, that's good. And how has lockdown been treating you so far? Um, largely well. Uh, I pivoted hard and fast in the first couple of weeks uh, and as a result threw myself into doing loads and loads of stuff online and uh, completely leaning on my wife to look after our children and now I have noticed that and <laughs> changed what I'm doing. Yeah. And I've sort of also really decided or really kind of realised that we're recording this in the very beginning of June, uh, Jul- July, apologies, and um, I feel like we're secretly recording it in June and I've given that away and now we're yeah. going to pretend it's July, but that isn't the case. That was a genuine yeah. slip. Um, <laughs> uh, but I've realised my son is going to start school in September, assuming everything continues and there isn't a massive second spike before then. Um, so there is very little that I need to do now that I couldn't be doing in September. So I'm going to start really prioritising spending time with my family before one of them is lost to the system. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. And well, thank you uh, for spending time with uh, me on Castable. I, I really do appreciate that. Uh, um, but yeah, uh, so let's get into it because uh, there's a lot to talk about with this. And uh, the question I always start with with this podcast is if someone were to ask you what kind of music you are into, how do you typically respond to that question? Kind of badly. I'd respond badly <laughs> because I'm. Um, <laughs> I, I do like music, but I think my my I'm incredibly picky, yeah. and I can't listen to. I can't get into music and re-listen to it if a single thing about it annoys me. Oh, so really? I love the singer, but the lyrics don't mean anything to me. I can't get into it. If the singer <gasps> oh, no. and the lyrics are great, but I don't like the riff or the whatever it is. Um, and I'm not very musically literate, as you can tell. I've, I've heard of a riff. That's apparently a thing. Um, but basically, there only needs to be one little fly in the ointment for me to go, yeah, I'm not going to bother with that. So what I have always done, I now realise, is that I have found a thing I like and obsessively played it to death. Oh, wow. So I, I've got, I suppose, arguably eclectic tastes, but not broad tastes. <laughs> it's like I'm really into... Um, uh, I really like the mountain goats. I like Faith mm-hmm. No More. I like um, uh, They Might Be Giants. I've seen live. I like mm-hmm. Biffy Clyro. Uh, I like a sort of a, uh, I mean, I don't suppose that range is very broad. And I'm always, I'm always <laughs> like, but it, but it's not like I like many other things in each of the genres that those bands belong to. So mm-hmm. I just basically get a thing I like and then mercilessly beat it to death. You know what? I find that genuinely fascinating because I think a lot of my music taste has so many imperfections in it. If you know what I mean? I think, uh, like, if I were to get annoyed by one thing in my music, like, and it disown that band forever, I don't think I would listen to anything because, uh, especially like a lot of punk stuff, like a lot of the audio quality could be bad and stuff like that, or like it, it could, or especially like certain with all the music, there can be kind of like a lot of faux pas with uh, in terms of like you know culturally it's moved on since then, so it can be like, oh yeah, so. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a really great. Uh, that's, uh, I like because you're you you've got very precise music taste in terms of uh, it has to be 
what exactly what you like as well. So what? Yeah, what the absolutely. Kind of, Sorry, go. I, I was just going to say, um, like for example, in terms of like examples of flies in the ointment, I was yeah. really into counting crows. It yeah. was there for the nineties. Everyone was, <laughs> I was really into counting crows, and then so I loved their first album. Then I really enjoyed their second album. I liked Live Across a Wire, which was the live album, and then their sort of third studio album came out, and and I just went, oh, I don't like this. No, nope, that's me. I'm out. Oh but my it, god! It's, it's not that I ever. It's not that I stopped listening to the first two. It just kind of put me off. That and the fact my friend Quang pointed out that um, Adam Duritz from Counting Crows is a man who has certainly at that time he had stepped out with both Courtney Cox and Jennifer Aniston and was still whinging that he couldn't get a girlfriend. <laughs> like, all of his songs are a whinge yeah. that he can't get a girlfriend. And even I mean I love Pearl Jam, right? I yeah. love Pearl Jam. You know the more recent albums I'm less into. Because yeah. I'm, I'm in a different time in my life. But I was sort of remarking last night that there's a Tim Minchin song, I forget which one, where he does a tiny, he doesn't mention it's Vedder, but he does an impression of Eddie Vedder. And he sings the line, it's just one line in, in the kind of, in the sort of sprawling musical bit of one of his songs. And he does a line where he goes, oh, I'm really upset about some <laughs> stuff that happened in the past. And it, and it, it just, it absolutely skewers yeah. Pearl Jam in yeah. a way that now makes it hard for me to revisit Pearl Jam. Yeah. I just kind of like, for me, I, I love some of their stuff and I'm quite proggy. I love a build up. I love like my favorite song ever is Comforting Sounds by Mew, which is just this one riff kind of built up and played with over and over and over again. Yeah. It is huge crescendo. I, I, I like those kind of things. And, and Pearl Jam have got some, someone told me this was proggy. I don't know if it is, but like something like Rearview Mirror, where it's a build up to, to a musical and vocal crescendo at the same time. I think of also something like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. What's the song? Other Side, mm -hmm. whereby there's kind of, it's just a re there's incredible synergy in that song between a kind of a pulsing build up of a, of a, a guitar part or melody and then and it's sort of an eventual like a narrative any minute any minute no any minute any minute no any minute yes with the singer going i'm giving of my everything bang yeah. you know those moments i love but for example i have no interest in muse you'd think <laughs> i'd like muse there's so many people you'd yeah. think i'd like people are like you like this you'll like that then and i listen i go nah don't like the voice <laughs> don't like some tiny aspect of the lyrics don't like the haircut i'm out i can't get into it but because obviously you're a comedian if someone went to go and see you perform as a comedian and like you know what just don't like his shoes and just Bang. left would, would, i'm would you... sure that happened <laughs> <laughs> that's how that's how we met actually so uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah that's that's really interesting but have you ever wanted to be a musician yourself have you ever have you learned any instruments no dreadful absolutely dreadful <laughs> no no um i only I, I here's one of the big secrets of my life. I only ever bother doing things I'm a bit naturally good at. Oh, so really? I don't think I've really ever like. I remember picking up a guitar when I was a kid and going kaplong kapling, oh no thanks, and putting <laughs> that down. And so, you know, I've just have had absolutely no. I just don't dream very big. You know, I go, yeah. oh that that thing, that's that's not for me. Nowadays, I do think of it from time to time because I like um, I do tend to like singer songwriter stuff where it's one person exploring an idea just them and an instrument so huge fan of damien rice absolutely mm -hmm. love damien rice and because it's, it's intricate and he's incredibly good at suggesting a rhyme that he then doesn't do and i feel like you know it's a bit of um it has a kind of not, not a puzzle exactly but an intricate thing i like heist mm -hmm. movies for the same reason a suggestion again it's it's about narrative for me it's like you think you know where this is going and you don't, but the end was buried in the beginning. And you mm. get a lot of that with singer songwriters, good ones. You get kind of, or ones that I like at least, you get lots of kind of narrative uh, tease and narrative mm. resolution. I really like that. I was in a car journey very early on in my comedy career with Rob Deering. He mm -hmm. was the headliner, I was the host probably. And unusually, as you know, in comedy, the headliner was giving me a lift. He just had a nice yeah. car, drive it. And on the way, he said, plug in your iPod, remember them, to the stereo via a jack, remember yeah. them. And, um, <laughs> and, he, yeah. uh, and he said, just play me three or four different things you like. So I played him what I thought were the four corners of my music collection. And he said, well, you clearly like, and then bing, 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 bing. And, and I went, yep, absolutely I do. 
And he said, I bet you like these types of novels and these types of films. And I was like, you're absolutely right. Because I realised that what I had thought was a broad and eclectic range of songs I'd played him was effectively the same thing four times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Do you remember so, any of those songs? Oh, it would have been something like... Um, oh, God, I don't, I don't remember the specific songs. Because I, I think the other thing is that I... And Spotify has ruined me for this. Because I used yeah. to love mixtapes. Oh, and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. now or playlists even, but now, or like mixed CDs or whatever they were, I just don't remember what music I used to like. On my birthday, uh, I listened to Star Machine 2000 by uh -huh. uh, Wintergarten. And that guy is unbelievable. Have a look. I think it's Winter or Vin it's spelt Winter. Wintergarten, G-A-T-A-N, yeah. all one word. He has got a YouTube video of an instrument that he made that contains like a thousand marbles. He made the instrument and the instrument is based on marbles, falling down uh, marble runs and twanging notes. Mm -hmm. And you crank the machine and the whole thing is the most extraordinary endeavor. He created it, he built it and he plays this brilliant song on it. A friend of mine showed it to me again. I went, oh, I've seen this. And I suddenly went, hang on, Winter Garden. That's the guy that did Star Machine. So I played Star Machine again and I lay there looking up at the sky and watching these clouds and a sunset, listening to that, which is a preposterously brilliant song. Again, it's a little bit proggy. It's one phrase repeated over and over with increasing bells and whistles. And I do a lot of narrative work in my head. I listen to that and I go, oh, that's like the life of a child. And that's yeah. when they're a baby and that's when they're a toddler. And that all these different phrases have these different things. And I suddenly realized, God, I've not heard this for years mm -hmm. because of bloody Spotify, because I don't have any tangible music. I don't have 10,000 tracks don't downloaded on my phone. I've just got mm -hmm. whatever's on the Spotify playlist. Yeah. So I can't, this is a long answer to the question, do I remember what the songs were? <laughs> I don't because I can't remember what I was listening to in yeah. 2005. I can't yeah. remember what I was listening to in 2010. They wouldn't have been songs that were necessarily of that time, but they would have been the raft of 30 to 100 songs that I play all the time and that I've moved on from. So I wish someone could, if I had a time machine, I would not kill Hitler. I would use it for the much more important business of going back and seeing me you know, at six month or annual gaps yeah. and saying, Stu, what are you, I'm your future self. Don't worry, there's nothing to worry about. There's a pandemic, but just try and stay fit. Um, what, yeah. Just please let me know what are you listening to right now? Yeah. Because there will be songs I love that I simply cannot remember. Yeah, it's nice that you, you don't give yourself a sports book full of like uh, facts and figurines like Biff from Back to the Future. It's like, no, no, just give me an iPod and then I'm yeah, going to put I it just, on the want I want to learn from you. I'm yeah. giving you nothing. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, Bitcoin. Get one Bitcoin early doors. That'll do. <laughs> Invest in Zoom. So we'll, we should probably move on in a second. But before we do that, how many festivals have you been to but outside of work? Well, uh, very few, I suppose. Um, there is always a work thing. Again, I, I mean, I'm such a tedious person. What I do is I discover a thing I like and I hammer it to death. Yeah. So every year I go to Glastonbury. I go to Llama Tree. I go to End of the Road if I can. That's always work. I go to Latitude mm -hmm. if I can. That's always work. Um, I go to McCunthley. I think there's a comedy festival in McCunthley. Yeah. Um, but in terms of music festivals, festival, I would always try and get booked at yeah. because I, I've got a weird relationship with festivals whereby I love them and I look forward to them. And when I get there, oh, it's all just a bit of hassle. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like Glastonbury is my favourite because I regard Glastonbury as the theatre and circus green room. Mm -hmm. Some of my circus and comedy friends from all over the world being there and there's a slightly tiresome music festival nearby that i occasionally will be bothered to go <laughs> i'm not gonna traipse over there to the yeah. west hole field that's got what's gonna take about four minutes yeah <laughs> pyramid um so i suppose i mean that's largely to do with the fact that i'm i now have children and they always like my son's four he's been to four glastonbury's so oh, it, yeah. it's um one of those he was in the womb for because there was no reason. but um i take the kids and so now i get to do much less zooming around so the answer to the question is um very few that i haven't been working at but i have deliberately sought and nailed down work at a variety of festivals so that i can go to them i get very antsy watching music I'm, i i'm not one of those comedians who's going to self-diagnose with adhd but only because i can't be bothered um, yeah. I, I am a fidget, whatever, whether that's neurological or not. I'm a fidget and I can only really enjoy live music if I know it. 
So if I know the words, I will absolutely love singing along, bopping along. I was in the mosh pit for Biffy Clyro once again. Yeah. It was absolutely brilliant, and I knew all the music. Um, I, I'm not one of these people, and it, it fascinates me how people can do this. Walk up to a band they don't know, mm -hmm. stand there, and come away a fan. That's happened maybe twice in my life. Well, I find it really interesting to see that this is not a psychological podcast, but I, uh, it's, it's nice that you kind of all in or not at all for a band. Yes, like, okay. absolutely I, I, consistent I, I, in my tedious yeah. culture. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like I, I'm the kind of person I don't usually go and see bands I don't know that often because I think it's it is a risk, it's, but less so at a music festival because that's what it's for. But I kind of like just wandering up and just seeing the atmosphere and the vibe created as well. I think it's like a yeah, it's a kind of a magical aura as well. Regardless, let's go and set up camp. Great. Is there? Will you be playing a sting now? Which there is would be zipping a camping bag and hammering uh, tent pegs and all that kind of business. You know what? I wish I did that, but a squeaky I squeaky wheel on a wheelbarrow, some <sighs> squelching mud. That that's that's you know what I would you know what I would love that, but I haven't <laughs> done it. I've just, I've made some garage band jingles where I've sung over the top of them and it's quite silly. So it's <laughs> fair, uh, fair. um well if you wanted to do do it like, ee, 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 just, you, you're welcome to do that as well. Yeah, thank uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this is Matt Hoss here. Just a quick reminder to politely ask you to please subscribe to Castable as well as give us a five star review. It genuinely only takes about two minutes of your time and it really helps the podcast to be seen. Plus, it would make me incredibly happy to see those five star reviews. Thank you so much for helping. Please enjoy the rest of the podcast. About to drop some matches like I know I should But I just remember that I left it in the club I don't know how I'll get my high I take a look around and know I sigh But then my salvation, it comes through Cause I'm inhaling pure O2 Cause I'm going into the Oxygen tank Cause I'm going into the Tent, yeah. That was actually quite disappointing. So what is the name of your music festival, Stuart? Oh, good question. Um, I haven't thought about this. I mean, Stew Fest is the obvious one. You know, my <laughs> friends got married. My friends were such early adopters of the concept of a wedding festival that they had the, the website wedfest.com. And yeah. they let it lapse. <laughs> They'd be worth <laughs> tens of thousands yes. now. They oh my just god! Lapse. What's my festival called? Oh, I don't know. You might have to come back to me. There's probably a perfect name out there. But for now, let's let's give it the placeholder Stew Fest. Stew Fest is good. You can always have the the festivals festival. Um, something like that. Uh, <laughs> we'll stick with Stew Fest for now because I like that. So, do you know or have anywhere in mind that you think geographically your festival might be? Oh, let's go for the west coast of Scotland. Let's make oh, it. Oh, how it an island that's a pig to get to. Oh, or let's make it over <laughs> or something like that. Um, Sky. <laughs> I never made it as far. No, do you know what? Rothsey. I uh, I uh, filmed a, a kids' TV show uh, near Rothsey in the Kyles of Butte. In fact, that would make it difficult to get to. We filmed the show. <laughs> on four decommissioned uh, freight ships, like the ships yeah. you put like Maersk container ships on, um, and they were strapped together into an enormous raft waiting to be you know, taken to bits. So we'll have the festival on that. Lovely. I think that's, uh, that's brilliant. I like that. Because already so far, it's, uh, as you said, a pain to get to. And the west coast of Scotland on a freighter, it's... Uh, that, is the, that is <laughs> an absolute tip. My, and again, this is the same friend who had Wedfest. His stag do, this is podcast consultant Pete Dobbing. His stag do took place um, as far away, like deliberately inconveniently far away, mm -hmm. so that he could invite absolutely everyone he wanted to on his stag do, and, yeah. yet, be, and yet know that the numbers would be manageable because yeah. not everybody could be asked. So you get a self-selecting group of people. It's the same with McCuncliffe. You know, that's why that festival is so good, because only people who are cool enough to be bothered going there, you know, like they're taking several train changes. Yeah. So yeah, we'll do that. We'll do the Kyles of Butte on a bunch of uh, freighter ships strapped together. I like that. And it's already quite a tight concert. I imagine it's quite atmospheric as well, like uh, West Coast of Scotland, but also like on freighter ships. It's it's very um, it's going to be very boutique, I would say. Yes, very small number of uh, ticket holders allowed. Very as few people there as possible. Okay, what's the capacity? If you're saying them, <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll go for I don't know something like um, 
I mean, you do want you want the headliners to have a big old gig. So let's say five thousand. Five thousand. If it was five, it did. And you were talking about the selective process of that. It sounds like very Willy Wonka esque. Like just give out golden tickets to five of your friends, and that's. Oh, it's it. just people I know. Yeah. Why would you want strangers there? <laughs> Well, that's it, because like with music festivals and any gig, really, you kind of get there's always a worry that you're going to bump into some kind of dickheads and stuff like that. And people who are who are on the same vibe or are too drunk and being a bit aggressive as well. And uh, and that does happen at music festivals as well. But yeah, so if you get like 5000 nice people, that'd be great. Yes, it's um, it's so you get a thousand friends or friends of friends and tell them to invite friends of friends. And you do the whole thing in a very kind of stealth marketed way so it's called the secret <laughs> festival it happens somewhere fiendishly difficult to get to and invites are the physical tickets which you give to people you give people wads of physical tickets and they can give out a few physical tickets and it's never mentioned on social media wow and if you do mention it your your physical ticket is void done you're excommunicated uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like if you're a magician and you tell a magician's trick like yeah Right. Uh, so is there camping and are you a fan of camping uh, i again i look forward to camping i plan camping i camp often and then when i'm doing it i'm like oh god this is a pain in the ass <laughs> and but i think it's like it's like recreational drugs the best bit about camping is when it stops and you you come back to your house <laughs> like I've, I've, I've made breakfast in a campsite for the last three mornings and then this morning uh, i made breakfast in my house where i know where everything is and there's a there's a there's a hob and there's a there's a proper kettle and yeah a coffee maker um i do love the idea of camping i think i find camping a bit of a struggle because my wife and i have diametrically opposed goals when camping mm -hmm. her goal when camp my goal when camping is to take the least possible stuff in order to survive in yeah. order to thrive but yeah like, the game is you've got a go bag hey should we go camping let's go camping now in five minutes we're leaving the house that's the bag boom we're out her goal when camping is to make sure that she is prepared for every eventuality. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. They, they, it took us a while. Once I worked out that was what was going on, it was much yeah. easier to camp without rowing. But because um, I imagine you, you kind of like a bushcraft kind of person, like whittling a stick, like just ready for the uh, apocalypse. And, oh, I'm uh, not saying I've got any actual ability. I would <laughs> rather, I'd just rather suffer with no stick than yeah. feel like I had to pack loads of sticks. Because I can't, you know, I take loads of clothes camping and then I don't change my clothes. I just go wear the same pants for three days. Yeah. You know, like we've, I've got a camper van. I own my second camper van. It's a Mazda Bongo and it's absolutely lovely. But mm -hmm. it is too small for a family of four, really. We've got an awning that goes on the side. But the biggest problem is the beds in it aren't converted beds. It's not a rock and roll bed. It's just fold down back seats that mm -hmm. fold completely down. And then you have to wedge in strip after strip of foam that you have to carry there with you. So we've got this memory foam. So it's just, God, Matt, it's just a lot of faff. Mm -hmm. But once you're there and set, I mean, I'm absolutely the sort of nerd who likes to go, right, we're in the camp and um, we've, we've, we've settled, we're chocked. I love chocking the van. Chocking the van is just, you know what I mean? Like you're- It's as it put the woods underneath the- You've got two, well, we've got two yeah. big plastic chocks, really big, heavy duty ones. And you've got two, so you've got a choice of four wheels. You've got to set them. The most satisfying is when you're like, right, front mm -hmm. left wheel, di chock directly behind wheel, front back, uh, uh, back left wheel, it's six inches further back. So you've got a really way and you get yeah. it in one. It's fantastic. Then I hit my stopwatch. I'm going to make camp. And yeah. this, I came a cropper on uh, Friday because the lady who ran the campsite, not a festival, obviously just a campsite. She came around and said, cool, you've thrown that tent up quick. And I looked at my watch, which was still ticking. Yeah. And I, before I could stop myself, I said 34 minutes, 12 seconds. because It was still going. <laughs> and it's not like she suddenly was like, whoa, what a cool guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like a taskmaster task. It's like, right, get up as fast as possible. Uh, it's something like that. Yeah. yeah. How many days of this festival are there? Are they about the typical three or what's your vibe? you need it well when we go to glastonbury we go for a long time we get yeah. there as early as we can and we leave as late as we can so i think i do a long weekend which enables people to really overdo it on the sunday but mm. know that they've got the whole monday to recover and there's cool. nothing on yeah so yeah. we'll do we'll do thursday to monday brilliant stuff well i i think i'm very excited about this and i'm very uh, very excited to be an analytical hype man to go all the way to scotland and see your festival shoe fest and uh well without further ado let's get to the festival get ready for an 
gratuitous guitar solo. Here we go for 14 minutes. Okay, so we are at Stu Fest. It's uh, it's Thursday night or maybe Friday. Um, on your Thursday, do you have any musical acts, or is it just kind of like the oh, big box? Yes, yes, you do. You've got um, you've got musical acts, but you've got circus-oriented musical acts. The best yes. Thursday night act that I saw at Glastonbury was many years ago. They were called Fuck Knuckle and the Bastards, <laughs> and I I found out later, or I was told later, that they aren't so much a real band so much as a sort of an arty theatre collective who could play instruments who kind of put together that show as a one-off. Yeah, and it was absolutely brilliant kind of gypsy folk um just a kind of party band in a wooden barn like a sort of temporarily made wooden barn and they sang a song about cider halfway through and they threw hundreds of meter long paper straws into the crowd like meter long straws yeah and then had a huge metal bucket of cider down the front and everyone that grabbed a straw ran down the front and leaned in and had a oh my straw. god so they're, they're your perfect thursday night opener like that that's amazing was it was that fuck knuckle and fuck the... knuckle and the bastards of course. Uh, already you sold me on this festival. I'm loving it so far. And and they're probably, we're going to keep the vibe going with, uh, is it Gogol Bordello? <gasps> yes. Oh, Gogol yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, is that also on the Thursday as well? So you kind of... Uh, yes, that's the Thursday night. It's kind of a gentle lead in. There's only one thing happening on Thursday. So yeah. everyone goes to the, goes to that one thing. I always like the kind of Thursday or sometimes Wednesday for Glastonbury, that kind of the early, the, the pre, like the days before the festival starts, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the start of Rome, if you know what I mean. It's like, oh, everyone's so excited to be there. There's like kind of party and the, the things you don't expect to see there, the, the, the kind of the man, like the stuff like just going along to see uh, fucking knuckle on the bastards and stuff like that, stuff that you wouldn't expect, you didn't plan to your festival but do happen. I love those things as well because uh, I remember going to Glastonbury 2014 and again, similar kind of vibe. It's just this, obviously with Glastonbury, there's so many things happening at the same time and uh, my brother and I went to the stage and there's just this, uh, two, there was two guys just singing on stage and uh, they did the, a line they repeated quite a lot and went, uh, la 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 sha la 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 when you're talking about you and me and the games that you played and the crowd went and the games that you played and they did it for about 10 minutes and that was uh we still sing it to this day you know what i mean like it's it's so it's like i, I like it because it just stays with you those moments as well and i think that's a real and especially that cider bucket that's very uh i think yeah, people definitely. yeah i remember seeing uh, i remember seeing at glastonbury on the park stage Chaz and dave everyone oh my was god on, everyone was sitting on hay bales yeah and uh everyone had just wandered along and the thing about Chaz and dave is I mean, they're kind of ridiculous, right? Because they're Chaz mm. and Dave. And then you get there and you go, these guys have been playing as a band for years. They yeah. know exactly what they're doing. They're tight as hell. It's like watching Metallica. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> very different to watching yeah. Metallica. The point, is, the point is they're match fit. They're match fit for a gig and they know what they're doing. And, and you recognise way more of the songs than you realise. I had the same with Ash. I was hosting the Ben and Jerry's Sunday on the Common Music Festival. And uh, that was fun. God, emceeing a festival is so much fun. I've done it very few times. Yeah. I, I, I had to bring the proclaimers on stage to 10,000 people. And I, I was off my tits on the adrenaline of people going, Wah! you know, are you ready? And it was like, Wah! I was doing cartwheels backstage. I'm not even one of the proclaimers. I yeah. Know how they must have felt. Um, but I remember Ash, like I had no particular feelings about Ash, but then I introduced them, they played the set and being able to watch a gig from the speakers on the side of the stage is such a privilege. It's so fun to be on mm -hmm. stage with the musicians and see everyone going off in the crowd. And it just turns out I know every song Ash have ever written. Do you mean? Yeah. Because like without paying attention, I've just kind of go, oh, they did this one. Oh, this is one of theirs as well. Yeah. Oh, you know, so so that was that was really special. And I like um. I like a discovery uh, sort of a band. I saw it, um, I think it was at Latitude. Um, I saw Beans on Toast. Yes, he was sitting yeah. on to, to great things. But on this one, he was standing on a chair. I think he had an album he was selling called Standing on a Chair. Um, and he was standing on a chair in a little bubble kind of geodome tent being watched by a seated audience of maybe 20. Mm -hmm. And he was just going for it a thousand percent. Him and his guitar. It was the most guileless music. And it was just really charming. And I just came away going, oh, that person has just made a fan out of me but, by just going for it. Yeah, but I think that's that's why I like to see those random bands because you get to see 
you can go to see a band uh, who you like the music of, like the studio music of, but you go and see them and the heart maybe not be into it. But if you see just anyone being enthusiastic and just ca- put on a performance, it really sells yeah. it for me as well. That's why John Darnell from the Mountain Goats is cool because he's just being himself a thousand percent. He's not mm-hmm. trying to be anything. He's just loving what he's doing. Mm-hmm. By the way, we kind of glossed over it pretty fast, but if you don't have Chaz and Dave covering Metallica songs in your festival, I think I have to refund my ticket because that, that's, that's, <laughs> what, that's what I want, please. After your Thursday, uh, you, so you have Gogo Badello and Fuck Knock On Bastards, kind of a nice introductory to the festival. Let's, let's go head first into your Friday. So we wake up a little bit hungover and we're, it's a little bit cold in Scotland, but we wake up. And who's the first band that we're going to see on our Friday? I'm having Chili Gonzalez playing with Oh my orchestra. goodness. So I don't know about Chili Gonzalez. Can you tell me a little bit more about oh, what they do? Oh, yeah. Gonzalez. <laughs> um, it's a guy, Chili Gonzalez, and he is a sort of prodigious, uh, is prodigious the right word? He's an incredibly eloquent and very fast talking mm-hmm. rapper and multi instrumentalist. I saw him on the, I saw him at Latitude one year on the floating stage, the island stage, I think it's called. And it was him and just some, not not an entire orchestra but maybe mm-hmm. five pro orchestral music, musicians you know double bass flautists and stuff and um that was extraordinary um he did a song called working together which i really recommend and the other one is the other one that i particularly like is uh, uh start living your life as a concept um Chili Gonzalez, kicking the context. I can't remember it. What's it called? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, but have a little look on Spotify for Chili Gonzalez, um, because it's like, I, mean, I think he recently did an album with Jarvis Cocker, about like some sort of concept album about a hotel. <laughs> I haven't actually got around to listen to that. Um, so, a bit of Chili Gonzalez, I think. And open. so, uh, with Chili, uh, um, I said that very Yorkshire, Chiller, um, but like, uh, um, <laughs> but it, it, is it quite a bombastic opening act? Is it a lot of energy, or what kind of vibe is it? It's yes. He, well, he's capable of both. He's one of those guys like he can just sort of pull anything out of the bag. He's got that kind of Bowie yeah. quality of like, I can do all the music, so I'll just do whatever I feel Brilliant. like at the moment. And uh, yeah. So is there also a, do you have themes across your days or do you have a, is, um, or is it just kind of. Act- I, I think I would have themes across my days if I'd done a little more preparation, <laughs> which I, which I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't. <laughs> so this the lineup is largely going to be me suddenly going, oh, they'd be good. Like, I've, I'm pretty sure I've got one of my headliners that I've just kind of uh, yeah. pegged um, just on the basis. I mean, I've seen an awful lot of music at festivals, not by, I mean, often, often grudgingly. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, my wife's much more into music than I am. Is that fair? No, I don't think so. But she's much more into making an effort to see things. I miss things at festivals. Oh, I, really? I, yeah. yeah, I kind of, um, I'm just a big whingy dickhead. Really. <laughs> Unless, unless I know something, like it is so rare for me. Three things, yeah. Three things I love will line up. It'll yeah. be more like I'll have heard of. I'll go to Glastonbury and I'll go. I'm really looking forward to Glastonbury for the social and for the environment and for the atmosphere. And then I'll look through. You know, you go to the, the Clash Finder website and it tells you where everything is. And I go, great. I've heard of these twenty acts. Two of them are an appointment to view. Yeah. And then the others are all on at the same time as each other. So I don't know what the hell I'm doing. But um, if I yeah. think of if I think of the best things I can imagine seeing, yeah, that's good. Well, I kind of like your approach because you kind of like it's an organic approach, man. Yeah, it's an organic it's, approach. You kind of remind me of like a Roman emperor. You just like, I think we'll have some of this now. You know, like you kind of like handpicking, yes. improvising. And if any of the bands do anything other than play <laughs> all of the songs I like, they'll be executed. <laughs> yeah, they, there's just a video of you on stage on a throne, and you just go up thumbs up or thumbs down and exactly. everyone's like yeah but i like that so is that a stipulation that um would you like the set list of everyone to be like handpicked by you or would you have to like certify them if they went off i think they're allowed it? i think they're allowed one of their own choices and the rest of it i'm going to determine they can determine the order <laughs> and telling yeah. them what songs we're having yeah 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 uh, I, I think like it's that. important to constrain artists as much as possible yeah <laughs> Imagine a promoter going up to you like Stuart, can you uh, can you do uh, all of these jokes I've written out for you? But like you, you can do one of your own as well. Like, I yeah. would absolutely love that. Take yeah. all- <laughs> as long as I can have an auto cue, I'm fine. Yeah. All right. So after Chili Gonzalez and an orchestral start, which I think is a brilliant start, uh, way to start a day, who's next? 
Well, this is tricky. Who are your kind of middle of the day things? I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind something electronic. Fuck buttons. We'll have fuck buttons. Fuck buttons. Um, to uh, just, just I, I think the point of the festival is to is to keep people really off balance mm -hmm. because it isn't thematic. It's just what I want. This whole festival is going to be that moment at a party where you put a song on that you love and you look around, hopefully everyone else, <laughs> and they just hate it. Yeah. And this party is sort of revenge for all of those moments. Oh, I, you know what? That is such a beautiful moment. And I, I think everyone who's come onto this podcast has always been that person who is like, like guys, check out this. Everyone, yeah. everyone like this? Why is well, someone... It's, a, it's yeah. a very universal experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll have Chili Gonzalez. Then we'll have Fuck Buttons. Big electronic act. Um, big kind of dirgy, exciting electronic act. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll have uh, a bit of a curveball, Simon and Garfunkel, but they're only playing two songs. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> they're, they're guesting. It's Fuck Buttons featuring Simon and Garfunkel. Whoa. Are they so, both still alive? Uh, I, had, I think so. Paul Simon definitely is. Uh, I'm going to have lots of moments, I think, where people, you know, those moments where people will please welcome someone wildly unexpected. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, I think that, would, as you heard me do it, I was like, oh, what? Electronic music? And pop, yeah. Uh, pop, uh, yeah. I, like, I was really into when people started doing mashups. They're passe now, but when people first realized you could beat match songs or do mashup versions of stuff, there's a guy, who was the guy? There was a guy I saw do a beautiful, it was a little cabaret number in Australia, and it was a beautiful song. He's, he's a white guy, I think he's an Australian guy, and um, he was playing a sort of beautiful Korean song very slowly. Mm -hmm. And then the very last line of it, it was just a bit, the very last line of it is he sings Open Gangnam Style. <laughs> Realise he's been singing Gangnam Style. Like yeah. I love stuff like that. I love a really good. I love you know the Lancashire Hot Pots doing Jenny from the Block. I don't think yes. I've covered that, but that kind of a thing. Yes, know? absolutely. Like yeah. Uh, so um, like so Jazz and Dave like, covering Metallica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there we go. Yeah, something like but but get lots of guest spots. Um, and I remember I was watching. Who was I watching? I, there was one band on at Glastonbury at the other stage and they were going to be followed by Orbital. And I watched the first band and I forget, it could well have been Hot Chip. Oh, good God, lovely. I've seen Hot Chip about eight times. I think it was Hot Chip. And then I left before Orbital because with all due respect to Orbital, I've never really got them. My wife loves them. One of my best mates loves them, has worked with them and stuff. Um, but I've just never really, it's never really clicked. So I left in order to go and see the premiere of the new Doctor Who in a tent with some 12 year olds. And of course the new <laughs> Doctor Who was Matt Smith and he yeah. walked on stage during the Orbital gig and they played Doctor Who, you know, they do the, <laughs> Orbital, the Doctor Who theme tune. Yeah, yeah. Their, their version of it is superb. So I missed Matt Smith doing that. So, um, oh my God. the whole thing will be an attempt to get those special moments back in. Yeah. So to go back to Fuck Buttons featuring Simon and Garfunkel, which is yeah. a weird mashup, but which two Simon and Garfunkel songs did you say you wanted to play? And why? Any two. Just any two? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, any two. I, I'll have Feeling Groovy. I'll have Feeling Groovy or whatever it's called, 50 Second Bridge song. Yeah. Um, and, um, I mean, you can't get them there and then have, not have them do Sounds of Silence. You would... They can, I tell you what, they can do feeling groovy and sounds of silence. And if they breathe a line of Scarborough Fair, they get ejected off the stage. <laughs> kind of like a Bond car, just like shooting them off into space. Yep, there we go. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that's a already quite a um, a tough festival act to beat there, especially when you see uh, the finale of uh, Paul Simon flying towards the moon. Um, who was after that mashup? Um, let's have Jose Gonzalez. Doing some gentle covers so everyone can calm down. Um, <laughs> one of the best ever music festival heckles. My friend Joe was watching Jose Gonzalez and someone heckled him by shouting, play something similar. <laughs> so it's an honourable mention there. Yeah. Um, we'll have a bit of, a bit of uh, oh, we've had Chile Gonzalez and Jose, Jose Gonzalez. I think those are the only two Gonzalez's I can think of. Otherwise, we could have been going for a theme. Oh, yeah. um, and, then, and then I'll have a comic on. After, um, in, in the same way as someone like Neil Hamburger would open for Tenacious D, I think I'll have Matt Ewins. Uh, oh, my God. Doing whatever he wants for 20 minutes while there's a big changeover. So you would have comedians on the same stage as musicians. You wouldn't have the, yes. like a comedy tent. Uh, that's really no, no, cool. No, 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 no. It's all one venue. It's all I one venue. 
I kind of like it because it's kind of like old school variety because uh, they used to have uh, uh, front cloth comics. So they would drop down the, the red curtain at the front and the comedians would go on and kind of it's kind of like a compare, but you kind of, they are doing their time whilst the changeover is happening in the background mm-hmm. as well. So you mm-hmm. kind of have like comedian, like Matt Ewins doing his uh, wonderful set whilst uh, the changeover is happening. That's great. Yep. Yep. So then when you when Ewins wraps up, and, and I want to specify, Ewins can do whatever the fuck he wants. He's the only artist on the entire lineup yeah. that's allowed to do whatever he wants. Um, and then off the back of Ewins, I think we need something. Um, how many bands have I got per day? Because I'm envisaging we start at noon, so there might be quite a lot of time to... Let's do two more. So let's do that night. We're going to have... Uh, oh, let's have... Um, ben Folds doing a lot of um, uh, the stuff where he gets the audience to sing along and improvises improvises with them. Yeah, he can, he can do two of them, and the rest I'm just having my five favourite songs. <laughs> um, and then after Folds, uh, we'll have Pet Shop Boys. Pet Shop Boys to close oh, the Friday night. That's lovely. Um, there is a lot of eclectic taste there. Like you start off. Well, with you a... say that, but I'm naming every band I've ever heard of. <laughs> 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 yeah it's uh i like it though because it's there's something for everyone isn't there, there there's uh, electronic music there's uh some uh, kind of like uh, simon garfunkel you have uh, great comedians you have a uh, kind of crowd interaction and then you got pet shop boys as well yeah uh, yeah yeah but again glastonbury on the other stage they were just monumental it was so good and again i knew so much of it without knowing that i knew it yeah is that is that important for you something like subliminally like not uh, having that subliminal knowledge of a band being oh yeah i do know this this is great or do you do you prefer to know all the lyrics in advance um i i'm not going to enjoy it unless i know a lot of the lyrics in advance Mm -hmm. and i I recognize that that's a character flaw (laughs) no not all and i think we're just i think it's just uh how different people approach gigs as well um but why so what is it about pet shop boys that you what about their music do you really like what, why do you think they are the headline? I love the majesty of it. Yeah, I love the majesty, um, and I love their the visual element. I think they're really they they're the best kind of artist. They couldn't give a fuck, and so if they want thirty people on stage with big red flashing cubes on their head, they'll just do it, and no one's going to tell them not to because they're the Pet Shop Boys. Yeah. So I like that. Also, there is the familiarity of like they remind me. You know, I'll listen to those songs. I'll listen to It's a Sin or Domino Dancing or something. And it just kind of reminds me of being a teenager or in my early 20s in a nebulous way. I don't remember much of my life. My, um, that's an odd thing to say. <laughs> but, like, but I'm not, as a comic, yeah. you know, some comics can be like, oh, here's this anecdote and here's that anecdote. I just kind of, I'm so busy worrying about everything that the present moment for me is just worrying about the next moment. So mm-hmm. it's very hard afterwards to look back at certain years and go, you know, this is what I was doing and thinking then. I've just got no idea. So being mm. kind of comforted by nostalgia, nostalgic music or music yeah. that invokes nostalgia is uh, is very satisfying. That's a lovely answer, mate. So I think it's time to head to the Saturday because uh, we're going to have a... Uh, is there a big party atmosphere at this festival as well? Are people going to get drunk or is it just quite calm? Um, I think people can do what they want. I'm not going to, I'm legislating for so much in terms of what the artists play that I think I'm prepared to let the punters do exactly what they want. And if they piss off and it's just me watching the pitch, that's fine. My son's third birthday was uh, like all of it. We had a sort of secret forest disco for him where we'd kind of set up like a mirror ball and some music in the middle of a forest. And we sort of did a treasure hunt there and then found it because he just loves music. So, and I discovered music through him, which is really good. So there's all these kind of confused three-year-olds sitting around toasting marshmallows over a fire while my son is grooving out to Dancing on My Own by Robin under a mirror ball. Oh, that's lovely. So, um, let's have Robin. Let's have Robin open. No, let's not have Robin open. Let's have something gentle to open. On the Saturday, we're going to go in at noon. Mm. Emmy the Great. We're going to have some Emmy the Great. And then we're going to have um, Robin. And then we're going to have Tenacious D. Oh, mate, yes, please. Oh, hello. And, and, then, and then we're going to knock it right down with something. We're going to have Charlie Cunningham. And then after Charlie Cunningham, we're going to start hoofing back up into the evening with probably Hot Chip and then Faith No More. That's the Saturday. Bang. Holy moly. Like, 
I like how you teased that finally, but there was like, Matt, here's a sucker punch of awesomeness. Bam. Okay, a yeah. hot chip. Yeah. Then it was it hot Faith chip, no more. And then Spencer Jones, well, Faith No More set up. Really? Oh, man. Oh. Okay, let's dig into this because um, there's a lot of great content here. And the great Robin, Tenacious D, Charlie Cunningham, Hot Chip, and Faith No More. What is it about Tenacious D? Do they mean something in particular to you or are they just well, funny? Well, incredibly or? good. You really feel that all of their material is born of improvisation. Yeah. Obviously, Jack Black has got this incredible rock tenor voice, which he is just so... <laughs> I remember hearing him on Pete Holmes's podcast where Pete was saying that him and his wife did an impression of Jack Black that was just them going, fligoo. <laughs> he's really good at those things also he plays a huge part in my life now because he's the voice of kung fu panda and that is a oh, popular franchise yeah. in our house yeah yeah um but i've always i've really loved tenacious t not every single thing they've done but i think Boss. i mean I, I heard the um the pick of destiny soundtrack yes many many times and learned big portions of it because i do i get a thing and i hammer it to death <laughs> before i ever saw the movie Mm-hmm. and then oh, I saw that's the right. movie and the yeah. movie is not it didn't set the world on fire um but i think i enjoyed it loads more than a lot of people because i already knew all the songs well that's an interesting thing because um i think the movie came out or maybe the dvd came out in 2008 and i again like you uh my brother and i watched it religiously over the summer and uh and uh, as well as all my school friends as well like they we it, Tenacious D at that time, everyone knew, especially that that the movie album, everyone knew every song off it as well, like Master Exploder, mm-hmm. Kickapoo, uh, and like, uh, yeah, so especially Beezle Boss, which is so theatrical as well. Like, uh, if you go into a party and say any of those lyrics, people uh, absolutely scream it back at you as well. So I, I think... had no idea that anyone else was into them. I thought yeah. they were this tiny little band that only I knew about. Really? Like, they're playing Hammersmith Apollo. Yeah. So I went along, and it was one of my favorite moments at any gig is when they were doing a tribute and they and jack shouts he said are you demons and every voice in the house shouted nay we are but men rock and Whoa. did the devil horns on rock and it was just like 3000 people in perfect step it was it was just glorious i think i was at that gig as well or it might have been a different because they've done the, uh, the apollo a few times was it the gig where julian barrett came on stage and did a, a improvised with them? i don't think it was actually no okay no, different gig that. but uh, but yeah uh, yeah i uh, I, I tenaciously have been i've loved them uh, for a long time as well and i've always tried to wonder why i like them and it's it's because they're musical, but also I think they're just weird as well. I, I know that's such mm-hmm. a, a vague term to say, but they're very surreal in what they're talking about, especially their first album. They just have skits, which is, uh, I'm not sure how usable, uh, usual that is, but it's, uh, yeah, just them, like, kind of, as, as you say, like, improvising, and uh, it's just wonderful to listen to as well. And, yeah, uh, I, think, I think they do that thing that Goldie Looking Chain do, where they really dance on the edge of how real is this? Mm-hmm. Because you're listening to it going, these, these are just a couple of jerks no 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 they're they're playing a character but the character is so deeply a part of them they've almost got license to be appalling and behave appallingly whilst knowing that it's a joke but they tread that line very carefully yes absolutely and um, and particularly with the the d they have genuine musical ability like his, jack's voice is incredible and carl's great on the guitar mm-hmm. and he's just so good at kind of giving himself the license to improvise preposterously and then save all the good bits. Mm -hmm. So it really, I find them really surprising. That's one of the things I love because I I like a bit of comedy and sometimes it can get a bit guessable, particularly Mm -hmm. when you deal with, with songs. So what they've managed to do is make genuinely good music with really genuinely surprising comedy. Yes, absolutely. Oh, Uh, that was a very boring dry answer. No, no, no. Uh, Like uh, there was, to be honest, it's the content I live for, Stuart. So, um, mm-hmm. so uh, obviously you've got a great lineup here, but I, I want to double click on Hot Chip and Faith No More because I let's start with Hot Chip. Did you, you said just you say said... you're going to double click on them? Yeah, is that is it... well, I'm leaving this interview? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, There's a hundred times worse than using disconnect as a noun. <laughs> Okay. Double click on that. I nearly wrote in, I nearly wrote the phrase deep dive in an email <laughs> earlier today. I hate myself. Sorry, Matt. Go on. Well, I feel uh, I feel kind of uh, ashamed now, but you know we're gonna we're gonna uh, I don't want to say the term, but I'm gonna be a hype man who analyzes this now. But um, <laughs> um, so is Hot Chip a band that you've seen the most times? What 
is, is that um... they, they might be actually yeah um we just we're really big fans and um we've probably seen hot chip I mean, I think we must have seen them seven or eight times. They often play Glastonbury. We always go and see them when they do. Um, we've seen them in a couple of places. We've, we've become friends with uh, Rob Smouten, who I don't think he's in the band, but he plays with them live. He does mm -hmm. percussion and guitar and, and all sorts of stuff. So we've seen them another few times through Rob. Um, he's a brilliant musician as well. We saw his um, uh, his outfit. He's in a couple of different bands. Black Peaches, a mm -hmm. cracking band. We saw them at Glasgow just gone. Um, so uh we yes yeah, so i they're probably they are God, i'm so married aren't i, I keep saying that. <laughs> um, let's not double click on that um <laughs> so yeah I, I i sort of think i i think they probably are i've seen sting i think i've seen sting three times so he was a, he was a front runner for a while but no certainly hot chipper ahead of sting I want to also look at Faith No More because they were the one of the bands who sent over to me to do a yeah. bit more research. And I did know of them in the band. So obviously, they're quite a big band. Uh, but why do you think they are, like with my question about the Pet Shop Boys, why do you think they are suitable for your Saturday Night Headliner? Kind of because all of their songs are different from all of their other songs. Yes. They're so eclectic in their music taste. Um, you know, the Mike Patton has got this unbelievable vocal range. And mm -hmm. he's also, and again, I don't, I've, I've given a try to his, you know, to was it Tomahawk and Mr. Bungle. And mm -hmm. they're just not the same thing. It's like, there we go. I know what I like. And it's Faith No More. And I'll have a load of that. <laughs> I think Angel Dust may well have been the first CD I ever owned. Really? Um, and I think I just, if you just look at the album Angel Dust, Everything on it is profoundly different from everything else. And then when their latest album came out, they reformed and they put that album out and the song Motherfucker was their first release. And that song is absolutely perfect. And again, completely different from everything else they've ever done. I don't know that I gave the rest of the album enough of a chance to grow on me because I don't have time to listen to music. Yeah. Basically. I only listen to it while I'm driving. And often when I'm driving, I'm also working these days so that when I'm at home, I can be a dad. So I, I don't, in all honesty, listen to a great deal of music. And I do remember from when I was in my 20s and listening to loads, I would sometimes listen to something and go, I just don't know if I'm that fussed about it. And, persevere, <laughs> yeah. and then I'd really get into it because you need to, to be able to. One of my favorite things with, with electronic music, for example, is when order arises out of apparent chaos. So if you look at Thou Shall Always Kill, by Scroobius Pip and Dan the Yes, song. yes. I think Scroobius is fantastic on that. I think the rapping is great. But what I love about that song is the extended edit where Scroobius finishes rapping and then there is another two minutes of Dan Lassac doing that melody, mm -hmm. which you could listen to and think, Jesus Christ, this sounds like a Spectrum 48K loading in a blender. Yeah. And then you listen to it, you go, no, no, that repeats, that phrase repeats, that builds on that every time. Um so I, I love kind of what appears to be just a storm of notes mm -hmm. resolving into a thing. It has that kind of intricacy. So I, I suppose um, some stuff does bear. Uh, it, no, it doesn't bear. It requires repeated listening in order to kind of yeah. fully appreciate it. And I don't know that I've given that last album enough goes. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, Faith No More are really... Um... I again, I, I think uh, they played at Download 2009, which was the first ever festival I went to. And I, I, you know, when you're too young to really appreciate a band, and Faith No More were, were certainly a band I got into later in life as well. And uh, yeah, it's, I've always had a little, not not regret, but like a, like a minor regret that I didn't get to uh, really sh uh, enjoy it as much as possible as well at the time. But um, but that being said, I think we should head to your uh, Sunday, your final day of music, and okay. see who, who's there as well. Oh, my God. I mean, in what order do I put any of these acts? <laughs> On the Sunday, what I'm looking for is Daft Punk. Oh. I, want, I want The Lonely Island. Oh, wow. Um, oh, Zimmer. I have Hans Zimmer doing some of, my, doing some of the Kung Fu Panda soundtrack. <laughs> oh my god like Hans Zimmer that's that's a legendary show right there and already yeah. Sunday is pretty I'm I'm not sure what what was the there's a, there's a theme here but I'm not sure what the, the I'm going De La Soul Janelle Monae I'm going De La Soul yes. Janelle Monae um not in that order in that order maybe not in that order Janelle Janelle Monae De La Soul Daft Punk Lonely Island. I think Lonely Island are going to headline. 
You reckon? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think I want to go home humming Lonely Island, rapping Lonely Island. Okay. Um, and whoever else I said that time. So we have Janelle Monet, De La Soul, Daft Punk, Hans Zimmer, and Lonely Oh, Hans Zimmer. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Well, we'll open with Zimmer. We'll open yeah, with Zimmer. And he's got I... to do Inception, Interstellar, and Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> specifically, specifically from Kung Fu Panda, from Kung Fu Panda One, The Bridge, from Kung Fu Panda, from Kung Fu Panda Two, um, oh. I want, um, I want Zen Master. Uh, it was, was it called Zen Ball, Zen Cannonball? No, what's it called? Zen? I could look it up, but Zen, it's, I think it's called Zen Ball Master. Um, and then from Kung Fu Panda Three, I want Jaded, and then um, uh, the Dragon Warrior. I don't think Hans Zimmer's ever got requests to do Kung Fu Panda that specific. If I go and see Zimmer and he doesn't do enough Kung Fu Panda, I'm going to burn his house down. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But I actually think something orchestral and uh, soundtracky like that, that's a really good Sunday start because a lot of people kind of ignore that because I remember going to Glassbury in 2014, as mentioned before, and I saw like just on the Sunday people doing ballet, like the London Ballet I can't remember the, the full title, but they were just doing ballet. It was just wonderful to watch because it was just on the main stage and it just yeah. feels you're a bit tired and it's something soft to kind of draw you into the music. Yeah. You're not starting off early doors. Oh, also, Mountain Goats. We've got to slot the Mountain Goats there somewhere because we haven't already. So uh, where would you like to put Mountain Goats? You have Janelle Monáe, De La Soul, let's Daft do, Punk. Let's do Zimmer, De La Soul or a good Sunday afternoon. Um, so Zimmer, De La Soul. Who's coming to this fucking festival? It's just me. <laughs> This you, Della Soul, then, um, then I'm thinking of a comedian now. Who could follow? Who could follow Della Soul? Someone, someone doing something fucking ludicrous. Liam Williams, some poetry from Liam Williams. Yes, uh, and then whoever I said next, <laughs> Janelle Monae, Mountain Goats, Daft Punk. J- Janelle Monae, Mountain Goats, Daft Punk. Lonely Island. Specifically, what I love about Daft Punk is um, the way they they sample singing mm-hmm. into the notes, yeah, and they play like I don't even know what it is they're fucking doing. <laughs> they just turn music into vocals in a way that I simply do not understand and couldn't hope to ever replicate. And um, specifically, harder, better, faster, stronger. Yeah. And the one that sounds, what's the Daft Punk song that sounds like? It sounds like the music that would play when a monkey in a satellite beamed you up and gave you <laughs> the appropriate tools for the mission it was about to teleport you to. I mean, <laughs> what's, uh, I mean, if I were to guess that song, no, that's, that's pretty banging. Uh, I'm going to tell you and you will go, oh yeah, that one. You know, I, I think I will actually, because... I think it's aerodynamic. Aerodynamic, yeah. cool. I think Daft Punk, uh, I'm a little surprised at Lonely Island are headlining, but I see why, because it's a big sell but yeah but uh Daft well, Punk... initially my thought is that they're headlining because the lonely island are the soundtrack that i put on in emergencies if i'm driving back from a very late very far away gig and they've got to, i've got to survive the last hour of the drive at two or three o'clock in the morning yes yeah i put on the lonely island playlist of my favorites and i know yeah. all the words and it keeps me awake and it keeps me alive i owe them my life Oh, that's a wonderful reason. And I think any comedians listening to this will know exactly that feeling where like you've driven past the last serve station, your eyes are kind of a bit like sore and like it's the middle of the night and uh, you just need that extra little bit of energy just to get home as well. Yes. Uh, All right. Well, I think that's a, uh, is there anything, I think that's a pretty tight festival. Uh, By tight, I mean, there's a lot going on, uh, but I think it's all pretty wonderful. Would you like to add anything else to your festival? before we move on to the final segment. Um, what else could we add? Um, I think throughout the entire festival, um, there is a separate, smaller secret venue where New Model Army are playing for the entire time. <laughs> and at any time you need a bit of a break, you can just pop your head in and they'll just be bashing through everything they've ever played. <laughs> that really caught me off guard, but that's wonderful. I like that. Like it's hidden, hidden venue. Uh, yeah. All right. You need well, secret things. You need some whispers of like, have you seen the, have you seen the hidden venue? Have you, have you seen the? No, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you who's in there. And you've got to get to it through a tunnel and through a, you know, God knows, a rope swing or something, some sort of rope bridge. 
and it's like a speakeasy kind of thing. Like you have to knock on the door and have to say hundred percent. Yeah. And what I love, because already the festival's quite hard to get to, it's quite secretive. Below that, there's another layer of secrecy going like huh? Yeah, they're in the engine room. Yeah. <laughs> I've only just remember we're on boats. They're in yeah. the engine room. No, they're on a dinghy. They're on a dinghy that's being towed behind it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I think it's time to deal with some floor fillers. As with event management, things are about to go wrong. So here's some hypothetical questions that Stuart has to deal with in a manner that he sees fit. So, oh no, the Lonely Island have cancelled last minute. Who do you get to replace them? We don't. We cancel the entire festival. It's <laughs> going to be perfect or not at all. And then we start next year, and the next year's festival is called Fuck the Lonely Island. <laughs> what a massive rebranding from Stew Fest 2020 to Fuck the Lonely Island 2021. That's brilliant. <laughs> oh dear, one of your acts is running late and you need to fill for time. But fortunately, one of your favorite celebrities is willing to do a DJ set for you. Which celebrity would you pick to do a DJ set? Oh, I've just remembered I actually wanted DJ Shadow to headline. So oh. can I get DJ Shadow? Does he count as a celebrity? Uh, yeah, favorite you know, celebrity to do a DJ set. Oh, um, Josh Widdicombe. No, no, of course, of course, uh, James Acaster. James, a oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Both, both in fact. Well, Josh, when Josh and his brother Henry do the DJ sets of McConfit, those are yeah. always glorious. Yeah. Uh, but Acaster has, has put me in touch with some of the best music ever. Oh, so, my God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, just folk. He's just had, he's just DJing his folk collection. That's strong. That's very very strong. People are starting to set the festival on fire. How do you put out the fires? I don't. I just let them go for it. That's it. it has to end with it being burned down and everyone being taken <laughs> away by the police. Daft Punk hates the guts of Hot Chip and vice versa, and they say that they won't play unless the other one pulls out. So if you had to choose between Hot Chip and Daft Punk, which one? Would you pick? Um, I tell Hot Hot Chip that Daft Punk are not Daft Punk. They're actually a franchise. They're a Korean franchise of Daft <laughs> Punk who are wearing the same gear. So there is no problem. Faith No More said that they will play, but they can only do the most obscure set possible. Uh, do you agree to those terms? Yeah, don't mind. It's fine by me. Yep. Okay, cool. And finally, let's. your festival loves you, Stu, and they want you to sing one song at the festival. If you had to pick one song to join in uh, with the band on, uh, live, which song would you think you can smash and which song would you do? Um, I would do Moana Song of the Ancestors, which is uh, the the kind of the, the emotional crescendo, the narrative crescendo of the film Moana. Um, and I would do that with um, Lynn manuel Miranda and we would get Hot Chip to do it. Wow, that's brilliant. Uh, that's uh... Uh, I think this is a wonderful festival and thank you so much for coming on Stu. It's been an absolute Can pleasure. we call it Confuse Fest? <laughs> 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 because it, it's going to play to an audience of one. It's going to be me and 4,999 golden tickets. Yeah. In, like knee deep in unwanted golden tickets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you for Confuse Fest slash Stu Fest 2020. Would you like to plug anything before the end of the podcast? Oh, thank you. Um, yes, people uh, can see my online chat show. It's called The Infinite Sofa. And it's ruining me. <laughs> it's on oh. at 9 p.m. on twitch.tv slash Stu Goldsmith. But you can find out all about it at infinitesofa.com. And it's effectively me asking you to come and see it is the sort of the open mouth of a funnel where several weeks from now, you're part of this weird cult that wants to destroy me. Yes. Well, uh, if that's not an advertisement for that, I, I don't know what is. But also, if you haven't checked it already, which, and, and I, it feels weird for me to plug it this way, but obviously do check out ConComPod, which is one of the best podcasts out there. Thank so. you. It's, people often call it that for short. Its full name is The Comedian's Comedian Podcast. And Sorry. cannot Sorry. discover it by Googling ConComPod. <laughs> yeah, apologies. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Stuart Goldsmith. Thank you for your amazing festival. We'll Thanks, see you. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to Castable. 
Please follow us at Castle Podcast on Twitter. And you can email us with your own festival suggestions to castablepodcast at gmail.com. Please go and give us a five-star rating on the Apple Podcast or whatever your podcast provider is. It really does make all the difference. If you want to hear more of me, you can follow me at Matt House Comedy on Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch. I'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>